Do you know I work for the BBC? Hey guys, Gant here. God, it feels so weird to say that. Now, if you follow me or my content, you may know that I like to mention that I worked for the BBC. It's kind of become a running joke now that I have to mention it every time I get the chance. But I realized that I've never actually told the full story about what it was like working there and why I actually quit. So I thought I'd take this opportunity today to uh, actually tell you the full story. And what else am I going to put on this second channel other than more content around me talking about the BBC. So as you definitely know by now, I used to work for the BBC. Or did I? So guys, I actually have a huge confession I've got to make. I never actually worked for the BBC. I know, I know, okay? I've been lying to you for all these years, but please just let me explain myself. So yeah, I actually technically worked for a company called Atos. Now you may be wondering, what is Atos and what do they do? That's a good fucking question. Man, I fucking work for them. I don't even know what the fuck they did. Basically, they were an IT company that would provide solutions to different IT problems different companies would have. I think. So I myself worked on the BBC division of this massive fucking company. So essentially, I worked in a BBC building. I had a BBC ID. Uh, the office I was in was a BBC office and some of my co-workers worked for the BBC. But I wasn't being paid by the BBC, technically. So basically, whenever I was explaining to my mum or anyone who gave a shit, it was just way easier to say that I worked for the BBC. So a lot of people think that I was working in production or the TV programs, but my actual job was to do with the broadcasting infrastructure. Basically, my division was the people in charge for making sure that the programs would get to the televisions. That's really the simplest way I can put it without boring you all to death. Small little tangent, but my office was actually below the Top Gear offices when Top Gear was in its prime. And so one day I was in the toilet washing my hands after taking a piss, as I hope you do as well. And then I hear one of the cubicles flush behind me and I don't turn around to see who it is, uh, but I hear them walk right next to me and the person standing next to me is towering above me. So I look up, and it's Jeremy Clarkson. And while I'm gawping at the fact that Jeremy Clarkson is standing right next to me, and he's a fucking mountain, mind you, I hear another toilet go off behind me. And this person goes to the other side of me. And who is it? It's James May, who was equally as tall as Jeremy Clarkson was. So I have these two skyscrapers, Jeremy Clarkson and James May, standing next to me. I was in a Top Gear sandwich. And so after I finish washing my hands, I go outside and who's waiting outside for the two of them? It's Richard Hammond. But instead of looking up, suddenly I go from looking up at two mountains uh, to looking down. It was super surreal. And that was the first time I saw the Top Gear cast members. I'd see them walking around from time to time during the rest of my job there. But uh, that was the first time I saw them. And uh, of course it had to be in the toilet. Anyway, back to the BBC. So whenever I used to tell people I worked for the BBC, everyone would always have the same reaction of, oh, why'd you quit? That sounds like an amazing job to have. And honestly, yeah, I got to see a lot of cool places. I mean, I was basically a broadcast engineer, but I still got to see all the buildings where some of the TV shows were filmed. I got to see the back end of it. I even got to see some shows being filmed. But, you know, after a while, like everything else, it just became another job. It was a nine to five job. It was a grind. And after a while, I started to crave something new. Like the BBC was a cool place to work, but I don't think it's as cool as people would envision it to be. Since it's like the oldest broadcasting company in the UK, it is a very traditional company. And a lot of the equipment and a lot of the buildings were old as fuck. A lot of the equipment was like decades old. Some of the buildings were falling apart. And I swear, like there were some places that were still archiving their programs using tape. Tape. It really wasn't as glamorous as people might have thought it was, but that wasn't the reason that I chose to leave. Like a lot of other things, after the novelty wore off that I was working at the BBC and my bragging rights had gone away, it just became another job. It just became another nine to five grind. And after a while, I just craved something new. And I remember there were three exact moments that really just 
push me to change up my life and pursue something new. The first one was an encounter with a shitty manager that I had. I'm sure everyone's had an encounter with a shitty manager or a different story, but this one was mine. So for some of the projects I was working on, we needed to work late. And when I say late, it was just like the project started at 11 p.m. Now on this particular project, I was the one on site at the building making it happen. And my manager was comfortably at home managing things remotely. Now this project was meant to stop at around 2 a.m. Um, and then by 3.30 a.m., for some reason, it just wasn't working. And so I was busting my ass late at night trying to get this project done. And to incentivize me, my manager was like, you know what, we're gonna book you a five-star hotel so you have a great place to stay in tonight, uh, so keep up the good work. And at the time I thought, that's pretty fucking cool. This I've never had someone pay for my hotel in my life, let alone a five-star hotel, what the fuck? But then the hours go on, I get more and more tired, and by the time 5.30 hits, we finally get the project done, and at this time, I'm dead. And then I remember my manager thanking me for doing all the work there because he could have come on site to help out in case anything went wrong, which it did go wrong, but he chose to stay home and do this all remotely, so I had to do all the work. And I remember going back to the hotel and it was 6 a.m. and at that point I could only sleep for about two hours before I needed to go into work the next day. Um, so I was busting my ass for a free five-star hotel that I could sleep in for two hours. But then after all that, um, when the project got done, my manager was the one who took all the credit for the work and that was the first time I was just like, fuck. You know, I didn't really care that I had to stay up till 5.30 a.m. or didn't even get a chance to use this hotel properly. It was not getting the recognition for the work I had done and someone else taking the credit for all the hard work I had put in. The next thing didn't even have anything to do with my job because, you know, I was a guy who graduated with a master's degree in electronic and electrical engineering. I had gotten a good job, and yet still somehow I was struggling to get by. Most of this had to do with the fact that I was living in London and the wage I got, even though it was higher for London wages, wasn't coming close to covering the higher living costs and higher rent that I was paying to live in the city. And I remember one day my parents would come to visit me once a month or so. Now my parents are actually pretty old. My dad at the time was getting close to 70 years old, which is like retirement age in the UK. And to give a little background, my parents my entire life had busted their ass working at a restaurant to give me the opportunity that I did. So my entire life, I wanted to pay it back to them eventually. I'm an only child, so there was no one else in my family who could have taken care of my parents except for me. And the least I wanted to give them was the idea that they could retire in the next few years. And so finally, after I graduated and I got this job, I thought this was the start for me to finally give them that opportunity. My dad at least, because he was still busting his ass every day and he was almost 70 and I, I, I just wanted him to uh, take a break. But after a year of working, I remember they came to visit me and I had to ask them for some money because I was having trouble paying rent that month. And at the time, my parents were already having trouble paying off the mortgage, they were having massive credit card debt, um, and here was their son who had graduated from a nice uni and all that, had a nice job, asking them for a hundred pounds. And I remember my dad reaching into his wallet and giving me 200 pounds. No matter what happens, they never burdened me with the knowledge or the troubles that they were going through financially, but I knew what was going on and it felt like shit that after all these times, after all these promises that I said that my dad could retire, here I was still asking for money. And at the time I felt so guilty and it was then that I realized that this wasn't the future that I was promised. You know, as an Asian kid, we were told that going to a good university and getting a nice job would have fixed all our problems. That's when your life begins and that's when adulthood starts and everything's all sunshine and rainbows afterwards, but in reality, the problems never got solved and it only continued. And the final straw was an argument that I had with Sydney, my now fiance. At the time, there was just a lot of pressure on life. I wasn't happy with my job. Sydney wasn't happy with her life in England. My parents were reaching retirement age and still nowhere near to retiring. And I remember one time, me and Sydney got in an argument due to the stress of our situation. And at the time, I'd been talking about YouTube a lot with her. 
and uh, I think she just snapped and just said, just fucking quit your job and do YouTube. And me being stuck in my Asian ways, being like, I can't quit my job to do YouTube, that's ridiculous. And she's just like, yes, you can. And I remember saying, no, Sydney, stop saying that. And then she just repeatedly said, just do it. You can do it. And I remember one time she said it with such authority that something in my mind just clicked. And to this day, she still says that that's the only time that she'd said something and I was just totally speechless. Because I think at that moment, I think what I realized is that I could actually do it. Nothing was stopping me. And the only thing that was stopping me was my preconceptions about what my life was meant to be like. The career path that I had been sold my entire life. And so in silence, I sat down and did what any engineer would do. I problem solved. You know, I'd like to say that I walked in the next day and I told my boss to fuck off and then I quit and did YouTube, but no. I had a plan and I had to follow through with that plan. So while I knew I could quit my job, I knew that this was an extremely risky thing to do and I needed to put the pieces in place for me to be able to do it. So the first thing I did was I moved out of London and I moved to my family's house in Brighton. Now we don't live so close to the station so it was about a 20 to 25 minute walk to get to the station. And this wasn't even Brighton station, this was one of the stations around Brighton station so it wasn't even the main station. And the train to get to London, depending on the train I got, would take between an hour and 20 and an hour and 30 minutes to get there. And then after that it would be a 20 minute tube journey to get to my office. So door to door it took me between two and two and a half hours. And I did that there and back every day. So I was commuting every day for four to five hours. Now, a lot of people think commuting's fine because you know, you can do stuff on the train, you can work, you can watch anime, but my trains were so packed because this was peak rush hour that there was barely any room to stand in the train. In an hour and a half train every day, um, I would never get a seat. And I would always be standing up in a crowded train or in a crowded tube. So every day I'd had to get up at around 5.45 in the morning, go to work, do my work, come back, and then after I came back from the five hour or so commute, I would come home, eat dinner, and then script. At the time I was pretty infamous for uploading videos every three or so months or maybe even further and I knew if I wanted to come back to YouTube I couldn't get away with that anymore. I needed more consistent uploads and so at the time I started to script videos in advance. That's where you had things like Sword Art Online and Tokyo Ghoul in five minutes. That was scripted during this time period in preparation for me to come back. That's why I kind of thought I could do an anime in minutes on a monthly basis at the time. That's a story for a different day. But yeah I was doing Doing all this to save any money on living costs and rents that I could and I did this for a year and so I was preparing to come back to YouTube and living this life for a full year and by the year had passed I'd only saved up enough to basically support myself for six months in case things went tits up but I'd given myself a six month time limit and that was the time I needed to really establish myself on YouTube so I had to talk to my parents and it went exactly how you think it would go. But like, I don't really blame them because imagine you're my dad, you're 70 years old and your son says, hey, I'm going to quit my job to pursue this career in a field that I've never even heard of before because it's not even been established. I'm sure he thought, fuck man, how much longer am I gonna have to support my son? I'm never going to retire until I die. But I hold no ill will because how the fuck could they understand at the time what I was trying to achieve? And the rest, as they say, is history. I think the biggest thing I learned from this experience is don't be guilted into thinking that what you have is good enough. Before I quit, I was told that I should be really grateful for my position, which I was. I mean, I had a great job. I had finished my degree. I had a good education, but I still wasn't happy in the place that I was in. There are times that when everyone around you tells you that everything you have is enough, it isn't actually enough. Because if I had listened, I'd still probably be working at the same place and maybe still struggling to pay a rent, maybe not, who knows. But I probably wouldn't be able to allow my parents and my dad to retire, which I'm happy to say he is now. Look, the moral of this story isn't just to quit your job and pursue your dreams when things are going hard, 
but really it's to have a plan. I didn't have a plan when I was picking my university or course. I didn't have a plan when I was in uni. I didn't have a plan when I got my first job. I didn't have a plan when I was working for the BBC. But the first time I really, really felt alive was when I was working towards something. The five hour commute and coming home to grind out more scripts and videos that was hard, but it was the first time I felt satisfied with my life. I had a plan with where my life was going to go. The work may have been hard, but at least I was working towards something. I guess guys, what I'm trying to say is, did you know I worked for the BBC?